that the time falls back that Saturday night for Sunday. And then Friend Day, October the 11th. So that's two weeks away. Still going to do a Friend Day. Amen. So that's exciting. And hopefully you got a friend by now. And so that'll be good too. If not, make one between now and then and invite them to church. And so that'll be a lot of fun. And uh, we're going to do our Sunday Fellowship. Instead of being First Sunday Fellowship, we'll do that during Friend Day. And we'll have that as a lunchtime <clears throat> fellowship that Sunday, October the 11th. And I think that's all. All right, very good. Let's pray, and then Brother Ethan's going to come and give a devotion. Father, we want to thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege it is to be able to gather into your house. I pray, God, that you would meet with us, that you would speak to hearts, that you would draw us close to you, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would be with those of our number that are traveling. we got many that are out today. We pray, God, that you would watch over them and, and keep them safe. Lord, we do pray for those that are ill. We pray, God, that you would give them a, a healing touch. We pray that you would continue to protect us and guide us. Lord, we thank you that you would allow us to be able to come in and, and to be able to hear from your word. So I pray, God, that you would give us attentive hearts. Lord, help us to lay apart all those things that would attempt to uh, take us away from you and the things that you have for us and uh, let us just be attentive to your word. We thank you for it and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. If you were to take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and I'll read verse 24. It says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. President Trump once said, The beauty of me is that I'm very rich. And when I saw this, it reminded me of this verse. When the verse says we can't serve God or mammon, mammon being riches, we find that our dependence upon God should be above any materialistic things. I went through and did a word study of what else the Bible says about riches, and one of my favorites is Proverbs 23, 5. It says, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Looking around today, we see a lot of cases where godless people seem to prosper so much when it comes to money. Yet when we read this, we are warned not to even look upon it and envy it because of just how fast it leaves. We see now that when we look for rich for riches from an eternal aspect that the words of God are much more valuable. Turning away from a money-hungry mindset and increasing your dependence upon God gives a much more successful life. Next, 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. From this we see that riches themselves have nothing to do with anything bad, but it's the love of it that brings about evil. At the end it says this love pierces themselves through with many sorrows. So that means that it's literally damaging to one's life. Lastly, Philippians 4.19 4, says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Is that not the most comforting thing? While in the will of the Lord, he'll supply me with everything I need to be successful. It's about your priority list. It's an easy temptation to say to divide things and say, Oh, this is a church thing and this is a me thing. But once we realize that everything that has to do with me is in God's control, then can we serve Him and be successful. I'll leave you with the title of my devotional, which is Get Rich Quick, in Proverbs 2.24, which says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Amen. I'll leave those thoughts with you. Great word. Amen. Let's all take a hymn book, stand together. And turn over to page 227. Page 227, Saved by the Blood. <clears throat> the crew. 
brought up the crucified one. The angels rejoicing because it is done. A child of the Father joined heir with a son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Great to be saved, amen. Turn back a few pages to 210. <clears throat> 210. This will be your breathing exercise for the morning. <laughs> Wonderful grace of Jesus. <clears throat> The matchless grace of Jesus Deeper than the mighty rolling sea Higher than the mountains Sparkling like a fountain All sufficient grace for even me Broader than the scope of my transgressions Greater far than all my sin and shame Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus Praise His name Wonderful grace of Jesus all the lost by it I have been pardoned saved to the uttermost chains have been torn asunder giving me liberty for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus deeper than the mighty rolling sea Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled. By its transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, and the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. 
broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Amen. Great singing. Brother Dennis, if you'd ask a blessing on our offering this morning. We thank you for this time to come into your presence, to your word to talk to our hearts. Sing praises to you, Father. Yes, it's you. Had our preacher behind the cross, have given the word you'd have us to take to our heart, Father. We ask to bless this offering, magnify it, multiply it, and make it your glory, Father. We ask all this in my son's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, please, to be seated. <laughs>
I'm just glad we've got a faithful God to depend upon. Amen? You would, let's take your Bibles, go over to page 262. You can remain seated on this one. 262, the light of the world is Jesus. <clears throat> was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine at noonday, His glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. No darkness have we who in Jesus abide. The light of the world is Jesus. We walk in the light when we follow our guide. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, it's shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see The light of the world is Jesus Ye dwellers in darkness with sin-blinded eyes The light of the world is Jesus Go wash at His bidding and light will arise The light of the world is Jesus Come to the light, is shining for thee Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. No need of the sunlight in heaven, we're told. The light of the world is Jesus. The Lamb is the light in that city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand one more time. Turn over to 162. <clears throat> 162. <clears throat> After the first verse, choir is going to come down as we continue to sing. 162. <clears throat> to God be the glory, great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, a purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he hath done great things he has taught us great things he hath done and great our rejoicing through jesus the son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when jesus we see praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. 
praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done. Amen. If you're able to keep standing one more, we'll do 145. <clears throat> It's just too good of a song to sit down on. I don't know. I mean, if you got to, you got to. I understand. <clears throat> 145, you use it all. Amen. Use all the, all the lungs, all the unk. Amen. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attended my way, when Ms. Heather's got a special for us this morning. Thank you. 
So thankful for the truth in song. Amen. Yeah. That's a great birthday present. Amen, Brother Mark. <laughs> and if you would, let's take your Bibles this morning and go to Exodus chapter number 2. Exodus chapter number 2. <clears throat> Appreciate our visitors being with us today. I hope the Lord blesses your time with us. <clears throat> and thank you for being here. Exodus chapter number 2, and as you find your spot, if you're able, let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. So thankful God has preserved it for us. Amen. Right. Exodus chapter number 2, and let's go down to verse number 23, all the way at the end of the chapter. Exodus 2, verse number 23. You there? Say amen. amen. It says, And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered His covenant with Abraham, and with Isaac, with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. I want to bring our message this morning of living by faith. Living by faith. Let's pray. Father, once again, we just count it a privilege and a blessing to be able to be here this morning. Thank You, Lord, for the songs that have sung that magnify You. And Lord, we just pray that as we look through this passage of Scripture that You would speak to every heart. Lord, we are a nation that needs to live by faith and a living Savior. And God, we need you every step of the way. We're a church, Lord, that needs your direction, your authority. And Lord, I pray, Father, that we would learn some wonderful things about what it means to be able to depend upon you and trust you by faith and to follow you. We thank you for it. I pray, God, that if there's one here that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, Lord, that today would be their day of salvation. I pray, Lord, that they not go their own way and their own direction, but they would depend wholly upon you. We want to thank you for all the results. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. 
You know, the, Lord, uh, the Lord blesses a life that is lived by faith. And uh, that has to do with uh, trusting God's ability, uh, trusting God's timing, and trusting God's interest in life, and, 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 and then aligning our ways with the Word of God. That's what that's going to mean by actually depending upon uh, that faith. Sometimes we have the wrong understanding about what that means. We song, sing the song about living by faith. We think about, well, I'm just here to live by faith. And, and, uh, and we, we, we miss out on the meaning. Sometimes we think it means that it's faultless, that there's uh, you know, never any failing and that's not the same thing. That would be sinlessness and there's only one that meets that criteria and that's the Lord. Amen? And that's uh, the one blessing that, or one of the blessings that comes by looking at the life of Moses. Uh, amen? Moses was a uh, exceptional leader. Uh, he was used by God. Uh, think about it. The Lord used him to be able to uh, deliver the Ten Commandments to His people. Not only that, but the specs for the tabernacle and how God was to be worshipped and all of the elements that were, uh, that were there. He led the Israelites whenever they were uh, following God in the wilderness and uh, all the way to the border of the promised land. And, and then get this, he's in Hebrews 11. Amen. The great faith hall of fame. What a great man that we get to examine. And that's, uh, that's the chapter, think about it, that, that shows all the people that succeeded in their walk with God. They knew what it, was, what it meant to actually walk by faith. But you know, you look at Moses and he certainly had his moments. Amen. He had some times of problems. He had times that he failed. But a life of faith is a life that whenever you fall, you're learning what it means to depend upon God. That phrase is often used of falling forward. What does that mean? It means you don't fall back. No, it means when you're falling forward, you're still making some forward progress. Amen? You may fall, but you're getting up and you're, you're still, uh, you learned a little bit more about how it is that you can depend upon the Lord even during the time of, uh, of falling. And so as such, you don't let failure define you. Remember, failure is an event. It's not a person. Amen? Uh, you use it as a means of growing in your Christian walk. You know, God never wants to have a person quit. Amen? It's not His interest at all. Jesus looks at His disciples one day. Remember, He says, will you also go away? They said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. But, but think about His heart. He said, everybody's leaving. He said, are you going to leave? He doesn't want them to, to quit. In Psalm 78, God mentioned the tribe of, of Ephraim as being armed and carrying bows and yet turning back in the day of battle. Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Oh, he doesn't want to see us quit. And God's not surprised whenever people fall. But he still wants to use people even though we have flaws. Amen? Sometimes we try to excuse ourselves and we say, well, you know, I've just got too many issues. Well, join the club. And we're people, and there's going to be some issues that are there, but that's not what it means whenever we're walking by faith. In fact, that further defines what it means to be able to walk by the faith of God. Through Moses, we learn some things about what it means to live by faith. And the first thing I want you to notice is that you can live by faith regardless of the times that you live in. Regardless of the times that you live in. Moses' life began in a very difficult time. The Israelites were in captivity of Egypt. Uh, you remember the story, Joseph has, has died and a uh, new Pharaoh took over and he was there and he, boy, he began to oppress the Israelites. And, and then by the time we get to Moses, it's been about 350 years worth of captivity. Think about it. Uh, I was thinking about that statement. Uh, I've heard it a lot. I mean, for years and years I've heard this, and you probably have too, those of you that have been around a couple of generations before me, uh, is, I guarantee it was the same argument. Well, you know, this, this generation is so bad. I just can't imagine bringing a child into the world that we're living in. You know, and, and we try to excuse it, and yet God's still faithful. Amen? Regardless of the times that we're in, God's still in control. He's still on the throne. Why are we, why are we not looking to say, man, I want to be able to have as many kids as I can to raise for the glory of God and for the work of God so that we can combat such a present evil world that we're in? Man, I'm glad Amram and Jochebed didn't decide that it was just too difficult to have kids. Yeah, well, we don't need Moses around here. It's going to be too hard. They had plenty of reason to think that. Amen? They themselves, they had been born into captivity. They had no possessions, uh, not to speak of. They didn't have any savings plan laid aside for the kids. They had no reputation with the Pharaoh. They didn't say, well, we're going to have an easy out, something like that. They, but they did have faith in God. They knew where to depend. And so Pharaoh had given a decree 
that uh, all the little boys should be killed. And, and remember, there was, uh, there was getting to be too many of the Israelite slaves. So they said, you know what's going to happen? He said, these guys are getting too numerous. They're going to rise up against us, and we don't need the army getting bigger. So, uh, so he gave the command to all the handmaids. If, if the child was a, a little boy, then they were supposed to kill that child right away. And, uh, and so there was a literally a manhunt uh, that was going on. And a lot of the handmaids, of course, disobeyed uh, that order. But uh, Moses' parents displayed an amazing amount of faith, think about it, in not doing what their world leader told them to do. Man, what an amazing amount of faith it was. Hebrews 11, verse number 23 in that Faith Hall of Fame, it says, they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Instead of throwing their son in the river with the rest of the Hebrew boys, they made their son an ark. All of a sudden, boy, they, they were probably reading scripture, amen? Amen. They're like, you know, uh, this worked before with Noah. I think we'll do the same thing. And they made this ark with the bulrushes, and they, they put the, the, the pitch, and they, uh, they put the slime on there and, and made sure that it would be in, in good condition. And then they placed him in the river. Now I want you to notice what takes place here, because whenever they are turning the child into that river, what are they doing? They're putting him in God's hands. Boy, what a, what a mark of faith. Look in Exodus chapter 2, verse number 3. It says, And when she could no longer hide him, she took him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. She made all the preparations for his success, not for his failure. She made the ark waterproof. I mean, she wasn't just tempting God saying, Well, it's yours now. She did everything in her power to be able to secure the safety of that child. She made the ark waterproof. She placed it among the flags of the river brink. That means in the edge. She didn't put him in the deep current where things are flowing by so fast and say, get out of here, good luck. No, she put him right there in the right spot. And sure enough, Pharaoh's daughter comes to that very place. She recognizes uh, that ark and she goes over and remember she looks in and the baby cries. And, and uh, boy, she had a compassionate heart about it. She said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. That compassion, she had, uh, think about it, she readily defied her father's command. He's the one who said, you're supposed to kill all the Hebrew boys, and now here she is finding one of them. She's the only person to get away with it. So in this time, there was so aggressively against Moses, think about what he had. Well, he had faithful parents. He had a compassionate provider and Pharaoh's daughter. He had a selfless sister. Look at it. Look down to verse number seven. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, whenever she found the uh, found uh, Noah, she said, "Shall I, uh, Moses rather, shall I go and and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee?" Think about that. She was pretty quick thinking. Amen. Now all of a sudden, mom actually is getting paid for nursing her own child <laughs> by the guy who said that they're supposed to be killed. That's pretty awesome. You know, uh, sometimes we, we rule out what God does on a daily basis. We think, it's hard to live by faith. Faith in what? Faith in you? Absolutely. You're trying to live by faith in me. It's going to be a bad day. Oh, but God, man, God can take uh, the enemy and provide for you. Isn't that amazing what it is that God does? So here's Pharaoh calling for the death of all the Hebrew boys. But think about it. Guess who's footing the bill for Moses to be raised. Guess who's paying the grocery bill for him? Guess who's the one that's going to pay for the schooling? Guess who's the one that's, that's providing the roof over his head uh, later on? Hey Amen. He's going to have the time with Jacob, but then he's going to, to Pharaoh's house. Only God can do that. Right. David, uh, David in 20, uh, Psalm 23, 5, he says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Man, God's in control. You know, whenever Moses grew up in the palace, he had every opportunity that the world had to offer. He had every opportunity to fall into sin, to follow after it. The throne itself wasn't out of reach for Moses. But Moses was coming to that reality that it wasn't the life that he should live. Moses knew that it was, it was not God's way. So in Hebrews eleven twenty four 24, it says, He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He rejected the world's sinful pleasures. There's pleasures and sins for a season, amen. Afterward, going to catch up with it. He rejected it. In the times that we live, you know, we can still be a person of faith. There's the offer that comes by the world. Remember, Egypt's always a picture of the world in Scripture. We understand there's a lot of, of offering that comes in the world, in the world system, but you can uh, live for God instead. Remember, He has a desire for you to be able to serve Him instead. 
Secondly, you can live by faith regardless of your past. Regardless of your past. Now look down to verse 11. Exodus 2, 11. It says, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren, and he looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he, and they, uh, he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? Now, I was thinking, but this is a lot like the police drama that we have going on today. There was an Egyptian, one who was in authority, he's beaten the Hebrew. And then it says in verse number 11, it was, it was one of Moses' brethren. There was a kinship that was there. There was a relationship with there. He didn't like that. So he decided that he's going to step in and he's going to kill the Egyptian. Well, he buries him in the sand and everything. The next day he walks out again. He's got Hebrew on Hebrew crime. And they don't want anybody interfering. It's a lot like what happens today. Moses faced the same kind of life that we face every day today. The same kind of issues that we have. And Moses had a major failure. Now, the people uh, today, they think that they're good enough to be able to get to heaven. Amen? They, they think that they're good enough by their own standards. They're good enough compared to their neighbor. And guess what the, the argument is? Heard it so many times. It says, well, you know, I've never killed anybody. That's the standard. Not a matter of, I have never attained the righteousness of Christ. No, no, that, that's the bar, amen. It's the righteousness of Christ. Right. Nobody's saved by their own good works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can never do enough good works. You can never do enough good deeds. You can never help enough of your neighbors to be able to gain salvation. You can't gain heaven in that regard. Why? Because God's looking for righteousness. He's not looking for you to compare yourself to the murderer. He's looking for the righteousness of God. That's the only way you're going to get into heaven. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None are righteous. No, not one. We don't have righteousness because of sin. That's why Jesus came. Amen? Jesus came to this earth, lived a perfect sinless life, died on the cross of Calvary, and took every sin that has ever been committed, yours and everyone else's, upon Him. He endured the very wrath of God against sin on the cross of Calvary. He died for your sins and mine. They put him in that borrowed tomb, and on the third day he rose from the grave, and he's now seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for us. He's listening for those that will recognize they're a sinner, that Jesus is the Savior, and call out to him for salvation. Amen. Oftentimes we're in the same boat of saying, well, I've never killed anybody. You think about it, Moses couldn't say that. Moses, are you a good person? Well, I've never... <laughs> well... I've never killed two people. <laughs> but there was, a, there was a bigger fault in Moses than murder. Moses had a problem with authority. Murder was just the symptom. See, a lot of times people, we still do that today, we, we start searching for some uh, remedy to remedy a, a, a symptom, but we never actually get to the root. Oh, there's a root that, that is leading things about. Now look at it, verse number 12. It says, He looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now, why did he do that? You look around when you know the thing that you're about to do is not what you're supposed to be doing. You, you know it's wrong. That's why you look this way and you look that way. That's what shoplifters do. Amen. Shoplifter doesn't just walk into Walmart, grab something off the shelf, walk out the door, gotcha. You know, walk out, oh, you so dead, man. We never saw that one coming. No, they, they, they make sure they're off camera. They make sure they're, they're just kind of slide a hand. They're, they're pocketing their stuff. They want to make sure that we're in the big clothes and so nobody pays attention to what they're doing. And then they slip on out. They know they're doing wrong. They know that they're stealing. Amen. We had uh, the catalytic converter stolen off the van this week. Surprise. Amen. So, sounded pretty awesome whenever the kids went to put out door hangers on Friday. I was in my office and I could hear it. Oh, <laughs> Ray said, Dad, I think we've got an exhaust leak. <laughs> no, no, it's a straight shot. But, you know, I was going through the security cameras. So, Wednesday morning. And, and amazingly enough, 6 o'clock in the morning. Here's another uh, small thing I've got to tell off on myself real quick. Uh, because 6 o'clock that morning, the dogs were just going crazy next door. They were just barking and barking. And I went out and I looked and nothing was there. And I did what I always do. Got onto the dogs and told them to be quiet. And <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, then I went back in. I thought, well, I'm already up. you know. So I was over here at 6.30. Well, you know, at 5.58, there was a truck that came by, dropped a guy out there in the woods, and then he kept going. 
And then a couple minutes later, he passed back by, and then he came back around, came up, picked up the other guy with the catalytic converter, and they hopped in the truck and they were gone. Amazingly enough, they didn't just pull up over here by the cameras. They didn't park beside the van. They didn't come at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Why? Because they understood what they were doing was wrong. They didn't want to face the authority of the matter or a very angry preacher. So, so they go at, at, at unusual times and they try to conceal their methods. Think about Moses. Moses looks around. He knew that he was not justified in his actions at all. Other people, think about it, other people saw Moses' failure too. Amen? Not just for the murder. That wasn't the only thing that they saw. They also saw his problem with authority. Now look down to verse number 14. So he comes out, here's the two Hebrews in a fight, and he's trying to break things up. Verse 14, it says, He said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me, and as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now, isn't that something? He says, Who made you a prince and a judge? Who is it uh, that did that? They understood that there was a problem with authority. They were calling him out for trying to, to be his own man, his own authority. They knew that nobody put Moses in charge. He had acted in his flesh, and he, even though he, he might try to reason out his response and say it was justified, he knew it wasn't God's leading. He knew that uh, it wasn't what it was that, that God would have for him to do. So he was found out. Guess what he did whenever he was found out? He ran. The thought of Pharaoh's judgment caused fear. You know, as much as he had set himself up as being a judge and an authority over that matter. As much as he thought he was his own man, he still had this inner knowledge that there was an accountability there. He wasn't going to be able to stand before the judge, that Pharaoh, and say, I did it and I was justified in it and I'd do it again. No, he ran. It's like the proverb said, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. Well, this time he's got the Pharaoh pursuing He's going after him. Deuteronomy 28 verse 67 speaks of someone who disobeys God. It says, in the morning thou shalt say, would God it were even. He says, you wake up in the morning, I wish it was the end of the day. And then he goes on, and, even, and at even thou shalt say, would God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. He says, no matter where it is that you are, you're always wishing, man, it's the end of the day, I wish it was the next morning. It's the morning, I wish it was the end of the day. There's never any peace that's there. Psalm 44, verse 15, it says, my confusion is continually before me, and the shame of my faith face hath covered me. Sin brings fear, it brings embarrassment too. You don't want to face people, you don't want to face yourself, you don't want to, certainly don't want to face God. Before Moses was going to be the man that could be used by God, he had to learn what it actually meant to let God lead. He's going to have to learn what it means to actually follow God and live by faith. Now, if Moses would follow God's leading, then his, his actions are going to actually magnify the spirit rather than the flesh. Amen? Just like us. Uh, if, you, if you get away from reading the Word of God, you get away from the instruction of the Word of God, then you're going to start following after the things of the flesh rather than God. Amen? That's right. Amen. It's that reaping and sowing still in effect. You get in the Word of God, you understand what it is that God is showing, you say, all right, uh, that's God's Word, that's, that's my authority, I'm going to follow Him. You start following the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God works in conjunction with the Word of God. So here's Moses. Think about it here. He's the murderer, uh, the one who reacted on his passions. He overstepped his authority. Then he ran in fear, but he's still in that chapter of faith in Hebrews. How did he get beyond his past so that he could be a man that's living by faith? Brings up the third thing, living by faith is a personal response. It's a personal response. <clears throat> it's a response of understanding that God is the one in control. It's the understanding that you are to be yielded and submitted to Him. Now go down to verse 23. This is where we started in our text. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died. The children of Israel sighed by reason of their bondage, and they cried, and the cry came up to God by reason of the bondage. I love that. It came to pass in process of time. It's interesting the way the the way that chapter reads. That's what I was reading this week. And boy, I was like, that's just amazing, isn't it? So it starts off, you've got Moses being born. He's being hid. Uh, he's found. He's cared for. And then he murders somebody. It's a short chapter. 
Amen. There's a lot packed in there. That's his whole life. The whole beginning. Man, this was all that was going on. And it ends in murder. And then all of a sudden, the children are calling out to God. Children of Israel, they're calling out to God. And he says, I got the man for the job. Exodus chapter 3, you get to the burning bush. What happened? I, I mean, think about it. Things are moving pretty quick. You, you're born, you're hid, you're found, you're cared for, you're murder. Now you're a leader. How did that happen? And what's happening here is in the middle of this passage. Between the murderer and the usefulness, we've got a man that's learning what humility means. We've got a, a man who's learning what it means to submit to authority. He's learning what it means to have his character developed by God. God leads Moses to, to Midian. It's in the Arabian desert. Not the well-watered plain, amen. To the, the desert is where they're going. It's not the luxury that Moses is used to. Imagine Moses probably wondering, what in the world am I doing here? I mean, if you've got to flee somewhere, where am I going to flee? I know, the desert. And so he's just running along here in the desert, wondering what it is that he's doing. He finds a, a, a place. He finds where there's a well. A well in a desert is a good place to be. And he sits down beside that well. You know, God often uses that place in a Christian's life. He'll often use those desert areas. He'll use those dry times to be able to show you where the real water is. He'll, he'll use those times where you get parched spiritually to get you to the point where you understand where the real fulfillment is coming by the presence of God. That's what you see on the physical nature of, of Moses is what each one of us could probably testify to of the spiritual nature whenever we start getting apart from God and how much that we need Him. You know, whenever we study through the life of David, you'll see many times where God would take David to the wilderness. He would take him out to the desert. What for? To purge David of David. Whenever David would start getting too big for his britches and he would start making bad decisions, God said, all right, to the desert with you. And a little while later, uh, David said, I was wrong. He says, good, now get back to the throne. And he would take him back to that spot. Jesus used desert places for his disciples. Mark 6, 31, he says, Come ye yourselves apart unto a desert place and rest a while. So on one hand, you look at a desert place, and it's a good uh, place for there to be a purging of self, but it's also a good place of rest. Whenever Paul was saved, he went three years to Arabia. What was he doing? Learning of God. It was a great place to, to learn dependence upon God. A great place to learn who God is and how it is to depend upon Him. So as soon as Moses arrives, he, he goes, he sits down beside a well of water, and soon he found there's an opportunity to take a stand for right. All right, so here we go. Look at it. Chapter 2, verse 16. It says, Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and uh, uh, and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered the flock. Isn't that something? So here they go. Uh, these, these daughters, they come out. They got to water, uh, water the flock. And the men come out and say, get out of here, girls. We got our stuff to do first. About then Moses stands up. <clears throat> now, I want you to get a hold of this because Moses is still one man. Amen. Uh, it's pretty amazing Remember, uh, to live by faith is to recognize that, boy, God's in control and God doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. He's got a plan for you. He's got the provision. He's got the means in His hand. Amen? Even when it causes you to be able to stand up for things that are going to be difficult to be able to stand for. Now, I don't know about you, uh, but if, if, don't think of shepherds as being these, you know, kind of skipping through the fields, you know, with their little stick. I mean, man, these are the guys that stood up against the wolves and, and against the flock. And man, man it, was, it, it was all of these things that, that were leading and guiding. These were manly, manly, manly men. So here they are. They come up. They're throwing everybody else out. And Moses stands up and says, no, 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 we're not going to do that today. Uh, girls, let's go ahead. And he just starts watering everything for them. Takes care of all the needs. Nobody said, we don't know you, stranger. Get him, boys. There was none of that. No, he just, he just did the work, amen. Acts 7.22 said that he was mighty in words and in deeds. He took a stand. God was with him. You know, I, I think about whenever Jesus went into the temple and he over, overturned the tables of the money changers. I always think about that. None of them said, hey, you can't do that. It's my table. Come on, fellas. You, you hit him high. I'll hit him low. We'll get this guy out. Mm -mm. Now they knew they better back off. They knew that he was the one that had what? He had authority. That's right. He was right in what they were doing. And probably they were the ones looking to and fro 
They were the ones looking back and forth because they knew that they were disregarding the authority of that place. And you can argue <coughs> that it was the same action of Moses in Egypt as what he did in Midian. You could look at it and say, he's always doing the same thing. I mean, he's standing up for what's right. He, he had his Hebrew brother that was getting beaten up by the Egyptian. He stood up to him. Now then, you got these girls can't water their flock. He's standing up to the shepherds. That's just what he does all the time. But, but you notice know, there was a difference in Moses. There was a difference in his authority and his respect for authority. Why? Because whenever he stood up against those shepherds, he didn't look this way and that way. He didn't say, I hope nobody sees this. No, he was standing for right. He, was, he understood that the authority was there, his actions were justified, and he was able to make that stand without any problem whatsoever. He understood that that was the right thing to do. He didn't have to look around, didn't have to run away. And in fact, this event led to contentment in his life. Now watch what happens. Go down to verse number 19. So what happens is the girls, uh, look at 18. So they came back to Reuel, their father. Uh, interesting, Reuel means a friend of God. Amen. So they came back to Reuel, their father, and he says, he says, how is it that you come uh, so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses, Zipporah, his daughter. Verse 21, he says, Moses was content to dwell with Reuel. Moses, he went from being a prince to being a shepherd in a desert area. Amen. And he was happy to do it. He was going to learn what it meant in this time to be able to serve others. If Moses was ever going to be a servant of God and, and understand authority, then he's going to have to know what it means to actually serve also, to serve himself. Keep a, he's going to have to learn what it means to be able to keep a flock alive in the desert. Amen? It's going to be a big training ground. He's going to have to learn on top of that what it means to lead a family too. Now all of a sudden he's got a wife. You know, it's going to be, uh, he's going to be the husband that God wants him to be. And, and he's going to learn about what it means to have a self-sacrificing love for the good of others. And he's going to learn what it means to, to have commitment to somebody besides himself. He's going to have to learn how to honor God in that relationship. And he's going to have to learn how to fortify one another against failure. I want you to think about that and say, well, that's what marriage is. Doesn't happen overnight, does it? Married people. So I ain't got there yet. It took Moses about 40 years. Amen. It was a lot of work in that time. Now, God did all of this, and we see in verse number 23, in the process of time. In the process of time. That's what God was doing. In the process of time. See, we think about time, and we're like, man, it's not going according to my time schedule. Uh, things that are, uh, I want to see happening, they're not happening. They're happening. You just don't see it. God's, uh, God's not in a rush. Amen. He doesn't just one day say, oh, we got to make these changes quick. He's making them all the time. He's making changes in you all the time. The more that you're in the Word of God, the more that you're in the house of God, the more that you're around the people of God, there's an interest that's there, and there's a, there's a changing of your heart for the things of God. He does a little bit at a time, and He takes you to be who it is that He wants for you to be. He shows you what it means to be able to live by faith and to trust in Him and His abilities and His timing and His interest in your life, and then you yield to Him. In the process of time, God's working in Egypt too. The king of Egypt dies, but don't worry, there's going to be another Pharaoh, amen, going to be another oppressor that's going to come. There's always somebody waiting. And in the process of time, it says that the Israelites sighed. That means they groaned about their, their bondage. They often went through, you know, the Israelites, they were some fickle people, amen. They often went through those times. At one time, I'm so tired of this bondage. They get out of bondage, first thing they do, wish we were back in Egypt. They had a lot better food than this. Man, we had the best of the best over there. They really cared for a guy. They forget all about whenever they said, all right, uh, you know, you got too much time on your hands. Now you've got to make your brick. Nobody's going to get the straw for you. Uh, you got to go get your own straw, and you still got the same amount of bricks to do in the same amount of time. So try to make it with stubble. Amen? They forget about all the hardships that come. They forget that Egypt had a mastery over them, and they couldn't, they couldn't serve the way that they wanted to. Verse number 24 says that in the process of time, God heard. Whenever they were groaning under the weight of slavery, he heard whenever they were mistreated and they were suffering. And whenever they cried out to him, God, God heard that. Verse 24 says he remembered the covenant. 
Isn't that something? He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. That doesn't mean that he forgot it. Amen? I mean, well, God completely forgot about that covenant. One day he's like, oh, yeah. I remember that was in the back of the file cabinet somewhere. Let me... That's not what it was. It just means that he, he actively, uh, it, was, it was time to act on it. He actively remembered it. That covenant was given. Why did he have it to begin with? Because he was looking at the future blessings to his people. And he said, it's time for those blessings to come to fruition. It's time to fulfill it. Verse number 25 says that, uh, it says, God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. In his compassion, he looked and he saw they had, uh, he saw that his people had enough of Egypt. They, had, uh, they were ready to turn to God. The timing was right. The people were prepared. They were, they were man, their hearts were set on saying, there's got to be something better than the captivity that we've had. That's the same thing that a person goes through whenever they realize that the wickedness of sin in their life is so apparent. Man, they need a deliverer. Amen. They can't keep trying to live this life. They can't just try to be a better person. There's never any fulfillment that's there. They know that God has to provide something, and he did. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's whenever you say, hey, man, I'm tired of this. I, that's what repentance is. you got to change heart. you got to change mind about what's important. You're not following self anymore. Say, I'm following God. In God's ways, the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to receive him as my personal Savior. What a great opportunity it is to be able to change and have that life that's dedicated to God instead. So they had had enough of all that. They're crying out to God. And here's the deal. God says, I got the man for the job. I got the man for the job. Now, was he from a difficult time? Sure was. Did he have a past? Sure did. But he also had a time where he was walking with God, and he was learning what it meant to trust him. And God said, that's the man I can use. Whenever he recognized the authority, the real authority in his life, he was ready to follow his God. So he calls his servant Moses to be able to submit to him and deliver the captive people. In chapter 3, again, it's talking about the, the burning bush. Moses, he was, in the, he was in the middle of an ordinary day. Hey, man, poking along his sheep, come on, come on. And he looks over and he sees that, that bush that's on fire but not consumed. And as you look at it, it wasn't like the, the flame. It was the glory of God was in that bush. So he says, look at it in Exodus 3, verse number Four says, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. He said, Moses, Moses, he said, here am I. It was God that called him out of that bush. Verse number six says that Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. He wasn't just looking at a bush. Oh, that was God that was speaking to him. And it happened because he was faithful to yield to God's authority. I tell you, we should never get so comfortable in our Routines as we go about life and thinking about the behavior and, and, the, 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 and there's no thought that God is with us all along. God has a plan in our life. We should never start thinking of our life as ordinary. They say, well, I hadn't really seen a whole lot. God's working. God's still doing a great and a mighty work. Living by faith, it's never a dull life. There may be some things that you do on a continual basis. It's not dull because God is always working. Uh, Living by faith is a surrendered life. It's a life where you're yielded to His authority. It's learning to yield to God's authority. <clears throat> so there are excuses that people often use today for not following God, living by faith. Well, you know, these are wicked times that we're in. I've heard a lot since the whole virus and all that kind of thing. It's a different kind of day today, no more than it was whenever Moses was born. Difficulty is a little different. Sure, difficulties nonetheless. It's a matter of depending upon God. You know, God's never at a point where he doesn't know what's going on. Amen. He knows everything about everything. He knows about the whole COVID deal. He's got it in his hand. We, we often don't follow God because I got a past. No more than Moses had. Probably a lot less than what Moses had. All it means to have a past is it means that there was a time where you were your own authority and you followed after your own authority instead of God's. And in that regard, everybody's got a past. What you do with that, that you know, that's going to vary, but everybody's got a past. Today the need is for every person to realize that we can never walk pleasing to God without submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. We get, uh, sometimes we get infatuated with the things of the world and we think, you know, it's so great 
when in reality it brings about so heavy of a burden. That's where Moses could say, man, I, you know, that pleasure of sin, it's, it's a season. Oh, but the end's thereof. Oh, it's a way of death. We should respond, receive Jesus Christ as a Savior. If you don't know Him as Savior today, I encourage you, stop following after the things of the world. God is ready to do a work in your life, and it begins whenever you realize that you're a sinner. He's the Savior, and you say, that's the walk for me. You can choose to follow Him. You can make Him the authority of your life. He already is the authority. And one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But we have the opportunity right now to be able to follow Him in trust and faith <coughs> and see the God of provision. Paul made a great statement in Galatians 2.20. He says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. God wants us to be a people who live by faith. Let's stand together. We'll have a hymn of invitation. Lord, we want to thank you once again for allowing us this morning to be able to look at this passage of Scripture and to be reminded that you are always on the throne and that you're always at work. And Lord, I pray, Father, that as we are gathered here together, Lord, if there's something that's been standing in the way of, of our walk with you, I pray, Lord, that we would be quick to be able to deal with that. Lord, if there's one here that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, Lord, would you convict their heart about that and have it settled today. Lord, we'd love to be able to show them exactly what your word has to say about that wonderful gift. And I pray, God, that there's nobody here that's going to leave without receiving it. And Lord, I pray that each of us would truly honor you in our hearts and lives and that we would put you first, yield to your authority, not follow after the things of self. Lord, not to get distracted by the things of the world, but to honor you and follow Christ. And we want to thank you for it all. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. <clears throat> if you'll take your hymn books. We're going to sing page 306. If you'd like to come pray, I invite you to do so. If you need to be able to see in the Word of God how you can be saved, let's just come up and show you uh, how you can do that this, this morning. If you've got a decision that you need to make for the Lord, why don't you come as well? 306, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way. Thou art the potter. To thy will while I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master. No, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, wounded and weak. so much for being here this morning. Hope you got something from the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Man, it's a great day to be able to be in His house. We'll be back this evening, 6 o'clock. I hope you'll be able to come back tonight. We're going to start up a new study. We finished up 1 Timothy last week. 2 Timothy today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hope you're like, man, I'm glad we're done with 1 Timothy. 
It's a little different. Amen. There's a different, different theme there, so I hope you'll be uh, with us tonight as we begin this study. And, uh, and again, if you're visiting with us, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you so much for coming and worshiping with us this morning. Love to be able to get a chance to meet you back there in the back. And let's close out in a word of prayer. We do have choir practice this uh, evening, 515. So appreciate that as well. And our brother George Hamilton, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?